happy Sabbath. Tonight we're going to start a new book. And the book is called The Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. And we finished the book of Revelation last week. And Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing is authored by Alan White. And the information from this sermon is taken from the book of Matthew. As we know that Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, has five communications or five sermons from Jesus to the people. And Sermon of the Mount is one of the most well-known sermons among all five. Well, we are quite familiar with sermons, right? Every Sabbath, we listen to sermons. And sermons in church is about touching lives. It addresses the needs of the hurting world and offer words of faith to the doubting hearts. And Bible said, all sermons and spiritual instruction should aim to achieve spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. And this book is Jesus' sermon to meet the need of the world. And it was preached on the mountainside. And the location and the name of the location is not known. The Sermon on the Mount, on the Mount is also called the Immortal Sermon. It is immortal because the sermon is suitable for their time and continues to address the needs all the way even until our time. It is also the longest continuous communication of Jesus recorded in the New Testament. Tonight we're going to study why Jesus preached this sermon to the people. What is the background and what is the setting and how the Jews' national concerns affect their spiritual discernment, the spiritual understanding. So after the ordination of the disciples, Jesus, we talked about in the Bible study that Jesus chose 12 apostles, right? So after that, Jesus went with them to the seaside and he wanted to give them more instructions and give them more teachings to prepare them for their ministries. However, they were not alone for long because crowds began to gather around them. It is, it is because Jesus has been doing a lot of healing and he was casting out demons. And so the people were looking for him to see and to hear more great things. People came from Judea, the south, from Perea, the east, from Decapolis, the northeast, from Edomia, uh, from Tyre and Sidon, from the north, and all thronging to this beach. It was to the point that the narrow beach couldn't contain them all. So Jesus led the way and brought them all to the mountainside. And they found a level area and accommodated this large gathering. While well, the people were constantly pressing on Jesus, they wanted to get a close look whether Jesus is doing any miracle, what is he saying? And so because of that, the disciple has to sit really close to Jesus so they wouldn't lose a word from his mouth. They were attentive listener and eager to understand the truth and the word that they caught from the master, they were recorded in the Bible. So make it to us even today. There was a special feeling in the air. Everyone was expecting Jesus to announce his plan for his earthly kingdom. The thoughts were filled with hopes and dreams. The disciple believed Jesus' earthly kingdom was soon to be established, and the Jewish leader thought Jesus would help them to conquer the Romans so that they would no longer be under their dominant power, and Israel will 
return their previous glory. And the poor peasant and the fisherman, they were hoping that Jesus would give them assurance that they don't need to live in the current poor, wretched condition anymore. And then they would live in richness and have no more material lack. We might think that these people have such shallow spiritual understanding or just thinking about their temporal needs. But we cannot blame them because they were the fruit of their legalistic traditional teaching mixing with their patriotism. The spiritual leader only taught them lessons of tradition and ceremonies without addressing their deep spiritual needs. Their leader even interpret prophecies to concur with their ambitions. They said the Messiah would come as a great prince from the lion of the tribe of Judah. And they never mentioned to the people that he would be the suffering savior as described in the book of Isaiah. God recognized the spiritual emptiness and he sent messenger. He sent John the Baptist. John the Baptist was preaching repentance, pointing the people to Jesus that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the sacrificial lamb. The people understood the purpose of sacrificial lamb. The lamb is to redeem sinners, to take away their sins. But their eyes are blinded at this moment. They couldn't see the Messiah in front of them. They couldn't see Jesus as the sacrificial lamb. The Jewish leader didn't want to listen to this message for the same reason. Ellen White said, if or had the teachers and the leaders in Israel yield to Christ's transforming grace, Jesus would have made them his ambassadors among men. Beside John the Baptist, John also sent his son to teach them the nature of the kingdom of God. Again, they heard that they need to repent. They also watched Jesus drove out the desecrators from the temple in Jerusalem. That Jesus chased out the money changers and those priests who, who colluded with them. They heard Jesus announce himself as the Messiah the one who would cleanse their soul from the defilement of sin and that he would make his people a holy temple to the Lord. But they didn't understand the deep meaning of it all. They saw only glory and comfort. They were blinded by their selfish interests. They didn't like what Christ was doing. They didn't like Christ transforming the spiritual views of the people. So they, the leader humiliated and belittled the humble teacher from Nazareth. But yet, deep inside them, they couldn't ignore the fact that Jesus spoke differently. Unlike them, he spoke the truth with authority. And they recognize that Jesus possessed great power. So here at the Mount, they gathering a people with expectancy. Ellen White said, great multitudes throng the steps of Jesus and the popular enthusiasm ran high. Jesus looked at the eager crowd he had compassion on them because he perceived their deep needs. He discerned that they have been misled by the religious leaders and he wants to undo the harms 
from the false education. He wants to give his hearer the right conception of his kingdom and of his own character. He was gentle, though, in his discourse. He didn't make a direct attack on their errors. He understood they had much miseries because of the sin. Furthermore, Jesus delivered this sermon because he had great works planned for his disciples. But at this time, the disciples couldn't understand the movements of Jesus. They had been baffled and troubled that Jesus made no move to proceed his, his cause by soliciting the help from the people of power, like making liaisons with the Jewish leaders. And also there was no plan mentioned by Jesus about taking the kingdom from the Romans. Despite the crowd's misunderstanding of Jesus, the time was ripe for them to receive the kingdom truth because the disciple had sufficient opportunities to witness Jesus' divine character and his ministry. They already spent quite a bit of time with Jesus. And the people in general also had ample opportunities to witness Jesus' power. They could not deny that he is someone sent by God. So therefore, the time is ready for Christ to confess openly the true principle of his kingdom and its true nature. Jesus began his sermon with the word blessed. Intend for the people to remember 14 centuries ago the other gathering of the Israelites at two mountains, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal in the valley of Shechem. The Israelites were listening to the voices of the priests from the mountains. From Mount Gerizim, they heard blessings, and from Mount Ebal, they heard curses. Blessings if ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, and a curse if you will not obey. This is recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 11. The people knew Israel as a nation didn't do as they had promised. They fell short of the high ideal which God has set for her. They fell, they are under the yoke of Romans because they've been cursed by God. Now before them is another Joshua. You know, both Joshua and Jesus' names denote God is salvation. So now there is another Joshua before them, and they are hopeful that this Joshua will guide them to glory. However, Jesus was using this piece of history to try to convey that no longer Mount Gerizim is the mountain to go for blessings, but the mountain where they were sitting is the Mount of Blessing because they were hearing blessings directly from the Savior, the one who would save them from the curses of sin. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus not only communicated the Beatitude, the eight Beatitude, or we call it the blessings, he also preached the spirituality of the law, the true spirit in serving others, the Lord's prayer, and not judging, but doing, and also not to worry or anxious because God sees and he provides. When Jesus was preaching this sermon, he seemed to have forgotten that he was on a dreary, sinful earth, Ellen White said. His lips was gushing out with blessing to uplift all who would come to him. Ellen White also said, 
the Sermon on the Mount is heaven's benediction to the world, a voice from the throne of God. And she said, the beatitude or the blessings is Christ's greetings to all humanity, not only to those who believe. From the very first part of the sermon, the beatitude, we recognize Christ take note at people's traits of character differently from the way that the world would look at them. The world pays attention to those who exudes air of importance, those who assert themselves to be above others for worldly achievements, and, and the world loves those who are wealthy and powerful. But Christ recognizes and takes notice of those the world ignores. The poor in spirit, the meek, the ones who are feeling lowly and sorrowful, the despised, the ones who are being persecuted. He blessed them with light and life. He told them, come unto me and I will give you rest. Furthermore, Ellen White said that Christ looked upon miseries and pain without regrets that he had created man. In his infinite love and wisdom, he recognizes that each man has potential beyond his sin and misery. Although that man might at the moment be abusing God's mercies and goodness, but God could see in him the possibility to change into someone who will accept his gift of salvation and glorify his goodness. Today, the sermon still has its power. It empowers men, regardless of race or social status, to aim high through Christ. It teaches that righteous character Living life like Christ can be attainable if man have faith in his words. Sermon on the Mount is considered to be the greatest sermon ever preached. Ellen White said every sentence of it is precious like a jewel from the treasure chest. The Sermon of the Mount will teach us to have deep understanding of God's law, which is the duty of humanity. And in chapter 3 of this book, Ellen White said, the sermon is the law, I mean the sermon actually is the law of God equivalent to the one he spoke to the people in Mount Sinai. But the sermon on the mount is spoken with accents of love. Here in Galilee, Christ open to the people the deep principle of the law proclaimed on Mount Sinai. And the thought of the Mount of Blessing also is light of heaven to illuminate our darkness. Christ was opening to men the spiritual kingdom of his love, his grace, his righteousness. Jesus, the Savior, is the only light that can illuminate the darkness of the world lying in sin. And the Sermon of the Mount, especially the Beatitude, gives hope and consolation. Men often become discouraged when they recognize that they are so inadequate, they are so weak. But the Sermon on the Mount gives hope and comfort to one that they need not to be shameful or despair. Sermon of Mount also bring comfort to those who are experiencing difficult circumstances in life. Though one might experience distress or adversity in this world, one need not lose heart because God sees all. In Matthew 7 verse 31 to 33, Jesus said, so do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, 
and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Next week, we will study the first blessing or the first beatitude. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Happy Sabbath. <laughs>